Good day, Deep and Word family. Welcome to day 295 of our Bible study review. Today, we're going through the chapters five through eight of the book of Matthew. Now, where do we leave off yesterday in chapter four? Jesus, right? The Messiah was healing the sick and his fame had reached beyond Galilee, beyond the Jordan River. Everyone, all of the surrounding nations were now bringing all of their sick to him. So he takes this opportunity as they're all pretty much forming a crowd around him, he preaches and says, blessed are these, blessed are these. And I want you to see, blessing is tied to the one who gives the blessing. Blessing is tied to covenant. And the covenant is made with the king on the throne in heaven. So I want to take you back to Exodus chapter 19. And I want you to see what the Messiah is trying to reestablish. So here we are. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will faithfully obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my special possession out of all of the nations, for all of the earth is mine, and you will be my kingdom of priests and a holy nation. I want you to take your highlighter or your pencil, highlight that he says all of the earth is his. And he says, if you obey my commands, which is his law, y'all, that's the covenant. Then he says, you will be my kingdom, my holy nation of priests. Keep that in mind. As our Messiah is about to give the Sermon on the Mount, keep this in mind. Why is this relevant? Because the children of Israel were just released out of bondage. They were enslaved and the father wanted to set them free and then give them his law. Show them the way of his kingdom. Now, let's go to chapter five. And we see some of the same elements, some of the same key words that is in Exodus 19. Pay attention to verse five. It says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Didn't he say that all of the earth is his? And he says, it would be your inheritance. Keep that in mind, please, because I told you I was going to touch on kingdom. Well, honey, we touching on it right now. Verse six, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What is righteousness? It is the truth according to Elohim's law, period. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom, 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 y'all. Our Messiah came to preach the kingdom. I will continue. It says, Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in this manner, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So he is showing you that if you are being persecuted for righteousness sake, it's because you are preserving something. You're preserving the way of the kingdom. Who else to show you the way of the kingdom but the king. Then our Messiah talks about salt and light. Isn't that so convenient? Because he's talking about the fact that there are people who stand up. They are persecuted because they stand up for righteousness according to the law of Elohim. So then he says, you are called to be the salt of the earth. What does salt do? It preserves. It preserves. What are you preserving? The way of the kingdom. He also says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. He's saying, shine your light bright. So what is the light? The light is the truth. The light is the law of Elohim. Y'all don't believe me that this is about the law? Then why does he immediately, after talking about salt and light, does he say, do not think that I have come to abolish the law? Why did he say that? Because many people would think that he would come to abolish the law. He says, I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one dot or one tittle will pass away from the law until all is fulfilled. And I'm sorry, has heaven and earth passed away yet? Has the new Jerusalem come down yet? No. So is the law done away with? No. Now, mind you, Messiah had not died yet. Okay. We're not New Testament yet, right? He's still under the law. And this is what he says. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do likewise shall be called least in the kingdom. Do you see he's reestablishing kingdom? Why? 
because their kingdom was broken apart after King Solomon. Why? Because they kept doing wickedness. They kept transgressing the law, which is righteousness. But he also says, but whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes, you will not enter the kingdom. Well, that shouldn't be hard because the Pharisees and the scribes, they were very compromised. So compromised that John the Baptist left and he started doing his ministry, his Levitical priesthood work in the wilderness because uh, the Pharisees, Sadducees and the scribes, they were corrupt. He's setting up the kingdom, y'all. There is no kingdom without laws, okay? The Antichrist is called the lawless one. So if you are fighting against the law of Elohim, you're looking a lot like you're playing for the other team. Why is he saying this? Why is he establishing this? Because he is about to bring them into a new covenant. He is about to bring them into the promise of the Father. And if you don't know anything about that, you need to read Jeremiah 31 because that is what Messiah is about to establish right now. He's preparing their hearts to receive a higher law, which is the spirit of the law of life. He is about to transfer something. And before he does this transfer, he is preparing them for what? The kingdom. He is preparing the ground of their hearts to receive the promise of the father. Jeremiah 31. Don't go further until you read it. There is more proof in the text behind all of this that he is talking about the law, all right? He is talking about the law of old and the law that he is about to establish, the higher standard that he is about to establish. Don't believe me? Let's keep reading. There are several things that the Messiah is about to teach on, and the first thing he teaches about is anger. This is what he says right here in verse 21. You have heard that it is said by the ancients, you shall not murder. Murder is the physical act, y'all. But anger is the spirit that is behind it. So he says, whoever murders shall be in danger of judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. Anger is the spirit behind murder. He's telling you that ancient Israel did things out of a spirit that they weren't even aware of. They were told just not to do something. But he's telling you in spirit not to do something. Let's continue. Now he talks about adultery. You have heard that it is said by the ancients, you shall not commit adultery. We know that is part of the Ten Commandments. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman with lust after her has committed adultery with her in his heart. He is revealing the spirit of the law of life. He's saying, if you've done it in the spirit, you've already committed it. Messiah is not coming to do away with the law. He's coming to fill it up full and he's coming to raise the standard. If you want a part of the kingdom, you have to be born of what? The spirit. Then he touches on divorce. This is what he says. It was said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Now Moses did this in the past because of their hardened hearts. The condition of your heart is an indicator of your spirit. Messiah says, but I say unto you, whoever divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. He is not letting them off easy. The condition of ancient Israel's heart was hardened. Why? Because they were enslaved for so long. Messiah is coming to deal with the condition of man's heart. That is why the father is about to transfer something on your heart. He's touching on all the laws of Moses. He goes into the oaths, right? It is a sin to make an oath and swear by the name of Elohim and swear by his footstool, which is the earth. Let your yes be your yes and let your no be your no. Because if you invoke an oath and you use the name of Elohim, you have now made yourself bound to that agreement that you have made. And if you don't do it, now it is a great sin. Because you have called upon his name and you have called upon his throne. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Do not be apart from your word. If you say you're going to do something, do it. And stop swearing on things. Why would you have to swear by anything? Is it because you have a reputation of lying? That you have to get somebody else involved? That you have to get the name of Elohim involved? That you have to swear on his throne? That you have to swear on his footstool? If you're known for being truthful and having integrity, then people already know that when you speak something, you're going to accomplish it. The teaching about oaths is really just a teaching on integrity. 
he goes on to teach about revenge. And he says, you have heard before an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But then Messiah says, do not resist an evil person. If they slap your right cheek, give them the left. What is he saying? Don't give evil, strife, anger, any power. Don't seek revenge on your own. Our Elohim says revenge is his. Nobody pays back the way that he does. So your best bet is to be righteous and not to hold any anger, any strife. Because the father is literally keeping an account of those things. And if they don't repent, they themselves will pay. And now he touches on a subject, which is loving your enemies. A lot of people have trouble with this part. But he says, you have heard it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now he gives a characteristic of the father. He says, for he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. He says, therefore, be perfect like your father. So what is perfection by the way of scripture? He just told you, do good to those who deserve it and those who don't. Be like your father Elohim. And if you exercise this type of love, then you'll truly, truly look like Elohim. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sin. Covering means atones, right? It atones for a multitude of sin and it diffuses the spirit of anger. Do you see how in all of these teachings, he is elevating the law from it just being a physical do not do this, do not do that. And he's showing you the way of the spirit. He's showing you the spirit of Abba. He's showing you how to be just like him. Chapter six, there's something that I want you to do here. Take a highlighter, please get a highlighter. And every time you see reward, highlight it because he is emphasizing something here in chapter six. So he opens up and he talks about charitable giving. And he's saying, if you do acts of charitable giving, he goes, don't be loud. Don't let the whole world know. If you want the whole world to see your charitable acts, then you're seeking the reward of the world. He says to do your charitable deeds in secret and your father who sees things in secret will reward you openly. Now let's move to the next part. He's talking about prayer. He's showing you how to pray. And he's saying, when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites for they love standing in the synagogues and on the street corners that they may be seen by men. Why? Because they're seeking a reward from men, AKA they're seeking a reward from the world. He says, but when you pray, enter your closet, shut the door, go to your secret place and your father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. Do you see that? Then he tells them how to pray when they're praying in secret. This is the recipe. Pray in this manner, he says. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. He's holy. Your kingdom come. I told you he's teaching on kingdom. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you see that he is teaching? Seek first the kingdom and all else will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom and your rewards will follow from him. Then he teaches about fasting. And he says, when you go to fast, don't let the whole world know. Don't have a scowl on your face. Don't make a public show of it. When you're fasting, this is between you and Elohim. Fasting should not be a show that you put on. If you're putting on a show and you're looking for some type of reward from man, he's saying that's all the reward you're gonna get. You're not going to get it from the father because you are not seeking him. You're seeking the praise. You're seeking a reward from man. Don't believe me? Get that highlighter out because he's going to say it again. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. I want y'all to see how he's tying every loose end up. Our Messiah is not playing. Have you highlighted reward for everything? Because now Messiah is going to actually talk about those rewards. He rolls right into it. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where the moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven. These are the rewards he's talking about. Put a pin in the rewards. We're going to touch back on this. We're going to touch back on the treasures of heaven. Now he talks about two masters. He says, you cannot serve God and mammon. He says, you will love one and hate the other eventually. This is all still tied into seek first the kingdom. Then he tells you, do not take care. Do not think about what you're going to eat, drink, all of these things. He says, these are the worries and the stresses of the Gentiles. 
Why does he say this? Because the Gentiles do not have a relationship with Elohim. We touched on the fact, seek first the kingdom and all else shall be added on to you. He's saying the Gentiles always try to make their own way of provision. But when you're under the blessing of the king, then he is the one who provides all of your needs according to his riches and glory. I hope y'all are connecting these dots, y'all. He's showing you the kingdom. Now we're rolling into chapter seven. And what does he open up saying? He's talking about judging others. Now he's not talking about discerning, right? He's talking about judging others. He's saying whatever measure that you use to judge something, he goes, don't be a hypocrite. Basically, do not elevate your sin above someone else's sin. If you are in error, correct your error first before you try to call out somebody else's wickedness. For an example, don't boast about the fact that you tithe, but you shacking up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Or you think you live such a righteous life, but you have no love. You hate your brethren. You're completely missing the mark. You're completely missing the whole point of this thing. Then he touches on this subject of ask, seek, and knock, right? You've heard before you have not because you ask not. Our Messiah says right here in verse 8, For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. This works on both sides. He goes, you're going to find whatever it is that you're looking for, basically. Then our Messiah talks about the narrow gate. The narrow gate is the way to life. Narrow, meaning there aren't many people on it. If the whole world is on this broad path, right? The whole world is moving this one way and you're not moving contrary to it. He's saying you're on the wrong path. The path of least resistance is not the way to the kingdom. There are many people who hide behind the guise of religion, but their life looks like their daddy is Satan. I can't tell you how many preachers and pastors that I see right now who are agreeing with the world and they're leading the flock astray. And so many people are delusional. They're just believing whatever the pastor says because they have no discernment. Everything is supposed to be held up by this word. And if it does not stand up to this word, honey, it is false. Not everyone who comes to me and says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom. He says, many will come and say, didn't I do this in your name? Didn't I do this in your name? And he says, depart from me, you who practice wickedness or lawlessness. In conclusion to this chapter, he tells you how to build your house, right? Or tells you how to build the true temple of Elohim. This is what he says. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, not just hears them, but does them, applies the knowledge. He says, I will liken them to a wise man who builds his house on the rock because our Messiah is the rock. You either build your house on him or your house is going to be washed away by the quicksand. He is instilling kingdom principles. Prince meaning first. So if you don't put the prince first, who is Messiah Yeshua, and you don't hear what he says and you don't do what he says to do, you in a dangerous place because you might hear, depart from me. I don't know you. Those are the scariest words that anyone will ever hear. I don't know about you, but I refuse to hear those words. Now we're walking into chapter eight. Now we see that Messiah has established these principles, these kingdom principles. Then he goes to show the power that goes along with those who remain true to those biblical principles. He goes on to cleanse a leper. And the only reason why our Messiah is so filled with the Holy Spirit, so filled with power is that he will not depart from the way of the father. Come on, y'all. Scripture goes on to tell us that our Messiah goes on continuing with this work of cleansing and casting out demons. And how is it done? By the word. When you speak the word and you couple it up with faith, then power is released. But here's the kicker, y'all. If you're living a life of sin, you can't cast out something that you're in agreement with. You have to deny the principles of the kingdom of darkness in order to be empowered to cast out anything. But many people are very comfortable with their demons. I know that sounds harsh, but I'm going to confirm what I just said. We're going to go down to verse 28 and we're going to end chapter 8. It says, When he came to the other side of the country, there he met two men possessed with demons, coming out of the tombs extremely fierce, so that no one could pass by. Suddenly they cried out, saying, Have you come here to torment us before our time? See, these demons, they know who he is. So they're terrified that their time is up because they know the sentence of their judgment, the lake of fire. And so the demons cry out and they say, if you cast us out, permit us to go into the swine. 
So he permitted these demons to enter the herd of swine, but the swine immediately went into the water and drowned. And it says that this whole city, they saw Jesus, they saw what he had did, and they begged him to depart out of their region. Basically, these people were comfortable with the demons because they knew that they were next. If he stayed long enough, he would confront the demons within them. See, if you're able to cast out a demon, it means you have a power. You have a power that is undeniable. You are representing a kingdom. You're representing the kingdom of light, which will then cause you to face your demons. It will cause you to face your uncleanliness. That is why ultimately they asked him to leave. Well, Deep and Word family, that's all that I have for you today. Until tomorrow, Yah bless.